candidates and those who are at this moment not in parliament or not in uh, any position of uh, minister or so, how many of the new candidates have really prepared themselves? Which documents have you read? Which documents have the new candidates read to prepare themselves? All right, Constitution. <laughs> Former Minister, you're not allowed to say for. <laughs> Election ordinance and this ordinance that we're going to talk a bit about tonight, we're not going to talk about it entirely, but it's also very important. So the three documents that you should know and should start preparing yourself to know is indeed the Constitution, the Electoral Ordinance, and the National Ordinance on Registration and Finances of Political Parties. And this one that we're going to discuss tonight is just not just an ordinance, because violation of it could have very serious consequences. And so you really have to know what you're doing. We, as Mr. Bertman Hoffman said, just know we are the Electoral Council. And so what is the Electoral Council and what does the Electoral Council do? The Electoral Council is charged with a task assigned to it by the National Ordinance on Registration and Finances of Political Parties. And what are those tasks? The first task of the Electoral Council is registration of political parties as well as their, as well as their um, references. The references is the, 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 the name you see above the candidate list that also have to be registered with the Electoral Council. We don't only register the parties and the references, but we also deregister them. If a party no longer wants to exist or no longer exists, we also deregister the parties as well as their references. And the second and very important um, task of the Electoral Council is what we call the financial supervision, and that has to do with donations received annual accounts, donation received by the candidates, as well as donation received by the, by the uh, parties. And so ultimately, the, the, uh, the Electoral Council is responsible for the supervision and enforcement of the compliance with the ordinance. So we have to make sure that the parties and the candidates comply with, that, with what is in the ordinance. And we're going to come back to that just now. And lastly, the Electoral Council functions independently of parliament and of government. Naturally, we are still dependent on finances from, from government, but we function independently of parliament and of government. In other words, no government, no parliament can try to influence the Electoral Council to go one way or the other. We have to remain above the free. Before going into the, um, the donation registration tonight, which is the most important thing we want to deal with tonight, we want to understand what are the objectives of the National Ordinance on Registration and Finances of Political Parties. To tell you the truth, we have one of the best ordinances in the kingdom. Just recently, we went to Curaçao to a conference in which the electoral organizations in, in the kingdom, so Aruba, Curaçao, St. Martin, and Holland were present. And when we look at what the other countries are doing with their electoral council, uh, how our, our um, um, ordinance is, we have one of the best if not the best. However, we don't comply with it. And that's regrettable. We have some of the best institutions on St. Martin, but we do not comply with them, and we don't let them function. So what are the objectives of the, of the uh, national ordinance? We talked just now about the registration of political parties. And when you register a party, it has to be according to certain guidelines. First of all, it must be an association. 
And secondly, there are a number of um, guidelines in the ordinance telling you how it must look. And why? And that is to promote a transparent and democratic structure. Regrettably, so far we have seen that most parties here represented tonight have beautiful articles of incorporation. And they really, they really comply with what the law is demanding of them. They really do. However, uh, is it executed? How many of the parties really function as an association and collect the contribution that they showed from their members? And how many of the parties really, the members really have a say in, for example, who's going on the list or not? We will soon, when we catch ourselves, start to look into some of these matters. Right now, we just, because election is going so fast, we can't even finish the last one. <laughs> Election should be every four years. You get a chance to wrap up everything, but we are constantly in a hurry. So we're still dealing with the last election. So the first thing is promote transparent and democratic structure of the party. And every, every party should have a democratic structure, not only on paper, but it really should function as, as such. And the second pillar, and that's one of the finances, and that is to promote the integrity of political parties and candidates, and why? To avoid a conflict of interest. So if a very rich businessman gives a candidate, for example, the maximum the candidate can receive, or even more, because that candidate promised to give them a special license, that's a conflict of interest. It's not only a conflict of interest, in effect, but even if, the, if it appears to be a conflict of interest. And we have seen that happen in this country before the Electoral Council was, was in existence. And the other one is to promote a balanced and clean electoral, sorry, political process. Some parties are very rich in terms of they have good contacts, etc., and some not. But every party now can go out and try and get the same amount because it's a cap for the parties and the candidates. You're not allowed to go over that cap from the donors. So it, what, what, is trying, what this audience is striving to do is to come to a more level, it's not totally level, but a more level type of playing field for parties and for candidates. Okay, so if you're in one party and you find, feel that like the other party where they have better contacts, then you just go out and get more donations. And when we talk about donations, what are donations? You can get donations in cash by check, but donations are also services or goods that have a certain value. The services, for example, I hear several people on the, um, on the radio nowadays, and I realize that radio personalities and radio hosts and radio stations are making quite a bit of money in election time. If all of us upset because we have these elections one after each other, believe in me, the radio stations and these people, they're happy. Okay? They're making some serious money. And when you guys get into parliament, you have to start to look at the media ordinance and communication ordinances. Because some people really put it a bit too high, in my opinion. That's my opinion, not electoral council, my opinion. So, services. So if you, for example, go on Lady Grace, and she might be charging $500, but she says, you know what? I'm going to let you speak for free. That's a donation. Because she has a rate sheet right now. Right now, they, all of them have rate sheets. How much you have to pay to be on their program or to be on the radio, etc., etc. Don't talk about Billy D. Huh? So, and if what did you say? <laughs> so what I'm saying, I just mentioned her. But if one of them, if you know they have a rate sheet, and if you know that they're charging so much for to all the, all the candidates, but somebody likes you and say, well, you know what, I'm going to do that for free, that. That, that means that you are getting a donation. Also, if you get, for example, you tell somebody, don't give me the money, 
but pay for the t-shirts, which I know that somebody did. They went in by a business with an envelope and they dropped the envelope and said, okay, no money, just pay for the t-shirt. That is also a donation. Because if those t-shirts cost $1,000, for example, you have got a donation of $1,000. You got it? Now, there's nothing wrong with that. So you don't have to go and hide and try to lie to us because sometimes you will still find out. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that in getting goods uh, uh, as, as a donation or services as a donation. If, for example, one of the Calypsonians make a wonderful Calypso for you, and believe you me, during election time, you just hear some very good Calypsos. If one of them make a good Calypso for you free, normally they charge to make a Calypso. So that is also a donation. You have to figure out to that person how much would they have charged if it wasn't to, to help you out, so to speak, all right? So remember that. We, we will ask, because we are hearing these things too. We hear these calypsos and we hear the airtime, so we will ask, if you say, which a lot of people say, of the 93, per, of the 93 candidates, I am almost certain that two thirds are gonna say we get zero donation. But if we hear that you had a jingle out there, and we know that jingle costs money, then that's a donation. So you would have to still note it down. Let me move this a bit, because he said I have to stay here. All right. What happens? How does the financial administration look? Now, all of this here, the registration of donation given to candidates, registration of donation given to political parties, and your annual, your, your annual report, all of these, this here, these records, I want to remind everyone that they have to be kept for at least five years. I'm going to give everyone a chance to take up their phone so we cannot be disturbed when we're talking and we lose out. Yes? You take it off or you put it on vibrate, whatever that is, but please. Sorry? It's, no, no, you're allowed to cough. I'm talking about the phone. The phone, the phone. All right, so registration of donations given to candidates. They also, your record have to be kept for five years. Registration of donations given to political parties. Records must be kept for five years. And then at the end, the annual report also must be kept for five years. And why am I saying that? The candidates that took part in the election in 2014, I hope they didn't throw away the registration because the law says it has to be kept for five years. And even that, Electoral Council can enforce. And we might still be investigating different things and you know, you can't throw away, we still need to see those things, all right? The candidates, candidates, should only submit a registration of the donations received in an election year. Normally, that would have been every four years. But the way we're going now, it's almost every other year, or every year. But the candidates should submit their donation registration to the Electoral Council every time they participate in an election. You have to start to keep record of the donations received from the day you are appointed as a candidate until election day. Now, the Electoral Council has decided that that day of your appointment would be postulation day. But there are some people who know way in advance that they're going to be a candidate on a list. And we have had candidates who have who have um, indicated, well, I knew from since, you know, way in advance, before postulation day, so they started to get the donations and they have rec recorded that. There's nothing wrong with that. But why did we say postulation day? Why did we stick to that? It's because we also know of situations where candidate on one day, the, the day before election day, the night before election day, they are on a certain party, and by the morning, they're on a, a different party. 
So we are looking at the day that you know, or that they think that they are in a party and suddenly they are left out of the party. So the Electoral Council also takes as that day of appointment, the postulation day. So as of that day, so all of you who are now candidates in here should have been already having a record, chronological record, of donations received one way or the other, and that stopped, stops officially on election day itself. So that period, that's for the candidates. That's not for the political party, that's for the candidates. That record should be submitted to the Electoral Council no later than the 26th of March this year. We have the 26th of, of uh, February's elections, and so the 26th of March, that's your deadline date. That's, if I'm not mistaken, a Friday. Now, if you have zero donations, if you really have zero donations, you're not tampering with things and hiding things and so on, you really have zero donations, you can come actually the day after election. And I'm saying this because it is incredible how often until the last day people bombard the office of the Electoral Council for we to help fill in the form. That's not going to happen. As a matter of fact, we don't even have an office right now. Hopefully by then we do. But that's not going to happen anymore. We give you this opportunity to come tonight and to understand what's happening with this donation so that you do not continue to harass the young lady sitting there so you know what is going on. And otherwise, go to your party. All right? Do not wait until the deadline date. If you don't have any donations, the next day come and fill in your stuff and bring it. Now, there are people who get donations and they're wondering if they're going to tell the Electoral Council, so the last one they come in with zero donations. It doesn't mean that we're not going to investigate, you know. Especially of late, we have two brilliant young men who are financial people. So, we, we, does that mean that we're not going to investigate? So, if you know you have zero donations, nothing wrong with that. Just come and get it out of the way. But please don't wait until the 26th of, of March. I think it's a Friday. Come in to, let me put it in our own language, harass people about, wait, how to fix this donation stuff and so forth. No, you have had the opportunity to understand it. We give opportunity to give information, and your party is also responsible to help you uh, um, fill in the donation. So we're going to give a demonstration how to do it. And lastly, I've said that you have to keep all records at least for five years, because even if you went in an election, you got so disappointed, you don't want to see nothing more for the election, you have to keep your records five years. So, excuse me? I didn't understand the question, please. At the end of uh, my presentation, I'll give a chance for questions, and then you can direct it to anybody in here except the Electoral Council, that remark. Okay, thanks. The, yeah. Donation for the political parties. Unlike the candidates, you have to submit the registration of your donations every year. That's unlike the candidate. As a matter of fact, some of you might have seen in the papers that we have just sent a press release and I think a reminder that the deadline for the candidate, sorry, the political parties from last year, and these are the registered parties. So even if your party doesn't exist this year, it existed last year, so you still have to submit before the 1st of February of this year your registration of donations received last year, okay? And also again, records have to be kept for five years. As a matter of fact, the board of a party should keep an update of how the party spend the receipts and everything like that because at any time, the Electoral Council could ask 
information on these, even though you don't exist anymore this year. And finally, another part of the financial administration is the financial statements. I said in the beginning that to register a party, the party must be an association. According to the laws of St. Martin, every association has to, has to have an annual report every year, so also political parties. And that annual report must be submitted to the Electoral Council before the 1st of April. We expect to receive annual reports with financial statements from the registered parties that were registered last year. Those annual reports should be submitted before the 1st of April. The annual reports have to have several things in them. So how does, who was in the board that particular year? Um, what was your be beginning statement of that particular year and your end statement of that particular year? As well as your expenses and, and what you received and so forth. It's not only in an election year. Regrettably, it tends to overlap, but it's not only an election year. Every year, every registered party that was registered in that particular year should submit for the following year, April the 1st, their audited financial statement. Now, how, what kind of information do you need to record your donation? If it is a person, you need the full name of the person, date of birth, their address, their ID number, and if it's a business, you would need also the full name of the business, the address of the business, and the Chamber of Commerce um, number, registration number. You also have to indicate the amount you receive or the value of the amount you received. And you also have to indicate the date the donation was received. Now, what kind of donations can you get? You can get donations that exceed 5,000 guilders. And that donation of 5,000 guilders, exceeding more than 5,000 guilders, you can get it from residents with voting rights in St. Martin. If you are not a resident of St. Martin, you cannot give more than 5,000 guilders. Okay. So if you're a tourist and you see a, a, a billboard from a very charming, handsome man, you say, you know, I think I want to put money on that person, you cannot give $5,000, has to be 5,000 guilders. So only the residents of St. Martin with voting rights can give more than 5,000 guilders. If you are a resident of St. Martin living longer than five years in St. Martin, you are also allowed to give more than 5,000 guilders. If you came to St. Martin a few weeks ago, and you're looking at all of these nice billboards, and you want to choose one, you cannot give more than 5,000 guilders because you, sh you should be living at least five years in St. Martin. Is that clear? It's not clear? So. <laughs> No. That's the law. I didn't make the law, sweetheart. I'm just carrying it out. Okay? All right. That's the law. And if you are a legal entity or a social organization registered in St. Martin, and we could check that with the Chamber of Commerce, you also are allowed to give more than 5,000 guilders. If you are a legal entity based on the French side of St. Martin, uh, based in the states, you cannot give more than 5,000 guilders. <laughs> Sweetheart, take, take a little notebook and put on all of those questions at the end. 
no, no, but just take a notebook and then at the end then we can, then we can have, have this discussion, okay? All right, thanks. You have a paper? Just write it down then there. All right, we continue. Cash donations, I'm saying cash, exceeding 5,000 guilders are prohibited. Cash, so if you get a donation by check of 10,000 guilders of those people living on St. Martin and so forth, it's okay, but cash donations, even if you want to give uh, someone every other day a thousand, a thousand, a thousand, a thousand, a thousand, a thousand. So you reach 6,000, no good. Cash donations is above 5,000 guilders is prohibited. Multiple cash donations from the same donor is also prohibited. And donations from, let us say, companies, organizations that are sponsored by the government, for example, schools or the port or the airport, agencies that government has something to do with, they cannot give donations, okay? All right, how much can a donor give to a party and also to the candidate? A donor, one donor, can give to a party 30,000 guilders. So a donor can give to a particular party 30,000 guilders. The same donor can give to a candidate 20,000 guilders. The total that a party and candidates can receive from one donor is 50,000 guilders. So you can have a party that gets 30,000 guilders and the donor said, you know, I like Harry, Peter, Paul and that same party. Then maybe every of those, Harry, Peter, Paul and somebody else could get 5,000 guilders. The total should be no more than 50,000 guilders from one donor. So if you have 10 donors, giving you the maximum, you have a half a million guilders, right? If I'm calculating right. You, at all times you have to see that you don't exceed, your donors don't exceed for one party, all right? So if you have a, a donor in St. Martin that wants to give to every party some money, he can, but for each party he cannot exceed 50,000 guilders. It has happened that the Electoral Council has had to ask parties to return the excess money to comply with the law. And there was some, we had discussions with the donors and we had discussions with the parties, there was no problem. And one of the reasons why some of these problems happened is because the party had no knowledge of how much the candidates had got. So by the time everything was counted up and checked, you notice then that the, part, the total was more than the party was allowed to get from one particular donor. So you can have more donors, give you the maximum, it's fine, but you have to really check your board, the treasurer, whoever, check and have an idea what the candidates also are getting. Because if a candidate get 20,000, another candidate get 5,000, and you the party get 30,000, then how much are you over? 5,000. Young man, you're a businessman. I thought you were an answer. <laughs> so, when you return the excess amount of money received from a donor, the Electoral Council has to get proof of that. So you can't say, yeah, well, we give it back. No, we have to have proof of that. It has also happened. I just talked just now about uh, persons receiving money from abroad, all right? A candidate in the past has received, instead of guilders, a bunch of dollars, and we had to ask that candidate to return the excess to the states, for example, and it was okay, and we got, a, we got a, the confirmation that it was done, it was nothing, you know, once, but it could, should not have happened once you know the law. But I guess the candidate did not know how much the business abroad was going to give, so they got the money and we explained to them, no, you, have, you cannot accept all, and it was returned. And also the other, those, those here in St. Martin that um, had received too, too much funds for their campaign 
had returned the excess amount of money. All right. The Electoral Council has developed an online registration system. And that was to avoid that um, if you have 90 or 93, or the last was 123 candidates, and everybody come with a different 190, uh, 25, okay. And this time it's 93, right? Have it correct? All right. So we have tried to avoid that everybody come with a different format. Would have made it very difficult. So someone would have come with maybe a paper as big as this. Another one will come with a half a paper. One will come with a brown paper. One will come with a yellow paper. And so we have decided to retain a company to develop our online database so that every candidate can make use of the same database. They will receive login information at the registered amount. What is one of the benefits of this is also that the electoral council can also extract information. So we have an idea how many candidates get zero donation, how many get from zero to 5,000, for example. And even when, how many candidates registered the day of the deadline, for example, and the total amounts and so forth, and how much whatever donor has given. So this is a very effective tool that the electoral council uses and once the candidate fills in the information, at the end, there will be a, 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 a note stating, I have truthfully and accurately filled in this information, and that information would have to be signed by the candidate. This donation registration, as I said before, is an online database that we have put together to really facilitate um, both the Electoral Council as well as the candidate. So if you have zero, you just fill in zero. If you have 10 donations, no problem. You, it's, once you click the first one, you have a second one, you can always go back and, 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 and add two, three, four, and five, etc. The only thing you really have to look at is not the total at the end, is the total that you have received from one donor that may not exceed 20,000 guilders. Okay, so if at the end you end up with two million gillers, for example, because you had, for example, 50 donors, that's not a big problem. The idea is that you cannot get from one donor as a candidate now more than 20,000 gillers. And the party are really advised to keep an eye on what the candidates get because that could be conflicting with what a party in total could get. All right, so uh, the moment a candidate is elected to parliament, the candidate has to, be, while they're sending in their credential to parliament, one of the documents, very important document, is a document you might not be able to see to clear from wherever you are, but a declaration that is stating for the the, the, those who elect a parliament that basically it's stating that they have not violated the laws of the national ordinance on registration and finances of political parties. We have seen candidates elect rush into the electoral council and want to sign this form. But you have to be very careful because if, for example, you have placed in your donation registration that you have got zero donations and you are in parliament and we have ever found out, remember I said just now five years later you still have to have these records, that you have lied at that time and that you did receive donations, then you have violated the law, you have violated the ordinance and it can have some serious consequences. So one has to think very carefully when one is signing that document and think, and maybe one might, one might want to change their registration donation before signing this document, because if it's ever found out, there could be very serious sanctions for violating the law. As far as the ministers are concerned, normally ministers are appointed. So within a month after their appointment, they have to sign a similar document, a similar 
uh, yeah, documents stating that they too have not violated the national ordinance on registration and finances of political parties. The Electoral Council has drafted the form so that not everybody comes with three, four, five different types of, yeah, I did not, you know, we draft a form, we take it very seriously, and that form is signed before the Electoral Council and presence of the Electoral Council. Again, if it is ever found out in future that you as a minister, even if you're appointed, that you, I'm gonna give an example, if you're a minister who was not on a list, or you were on a list, but you did not, um, you were not elected, and you receive money and you did not tell the electoral, electoral council, or you did not um, act according to the law to certify truthfully what you have received, also for you, you can ha it can have serious consequences, which could even be end up losing your position, losing your post. So these are the obligation after the election. Now, what are the powers of the Electoral Council? In order for the Electoral Council to carry out its tasks, it can request any and all information necessary. I just said just now, all records must be kept for five, for five years. So if, for example, we need information right now of the last election, which was just barely a year and a half ago, we, we, sh we must be able to receive it. We can also go as far as getting and accessing the books of the candidate of the party and of the donors, documents, and any other data carriers. We could take copies of these, or we may even be able to, we, we are even empowered to take away the documents um, for the purposes, and of course to return them whenever necessary. And any kind of assistance required by the Electoral Council must be provided. So people cannot say, I plead a fifth. I ain't talking. Because that is just going to get you in some serious problems. All right, you have to give the information requested. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm stressing this matter of keeping the records for five years, receipts and whatever have you, keep them for five years as much as possible. Now what are the sanctions? The first sanction, which we have already um, carried out towards a party and about to do so towards some candidates just now, is the order under penalty. What does that mean? If you, did, if you did not, for example, submit your donation registration and we continue to remind you of the such, then we could give you uh, order to do so under penalty, meaning that for every day you do not comply with that law, you could get a penalty which could run up. And that's one of the most lenient sanctions. The most serious sanction is that you can get fines if you do not comply with the law. The fines can go up to 10,000 guilders or three months detention and or both. And finally, you can also get disqualified of holding certain functions or offices. Now, all of this is just to make sure that we try to work in the most, in the most accurate, professional manner with integrity. There's no need to try to hide some of this stuff. Some people think, oh no, I can't let them know I get so, so much. No. There are some donors who might say, I rather that my name is not published. And we will respect that, but we, the Electoral Council, will have to know the name. But we will expect not to publish it. We have, I have here an example of our first annual report. In our first annual report, one could see, because we too have to be transparent, one could see that, um, who got donations and so forth and so on. But we never try, we have avoided stating in the annual report who the donors are, all right? But despite the fact that we will know who the donors are. 
So in this annual report, one could read, for example, who got zero donations, who got 15,000, who got whatever. It's, it, I mean, if you are transparent, it shouldn't be a problem. Okay? But if you insist you do not want the donor's name mentioned anywhere, we would know the donors, but it will not be published anywhere. But we too have to be transparent, so we cannot keep information just for us. The law insists that not only do we have to comply uh, to enforce the law, but we also have to be transparent ourselves.